Hello and welcome back. We're now into the 19th video in the Flow Certified Professional online training series. And we're continuing with the anticipatory vision sections. Uh, we set the base for this and the foundation for this in the last video where I showed you the Stacy diagram and the Kinevin diagram. And you'll notice that the anticipatory vision uh, picture is very much uh, looks like how I draw the Stacy diagram. So we're going to get into this in, in just a minute. The leadership takeaways uh, for this video are anticipatory vision is the key thing, obviously. And we're going to look at the soft trends and hard trends that come from those concepts. I'm going to give you an example of that, the one ten hundred example, out of my own experience and background of how this actually works. And then we're going to look a little bit at the ideas of operational excellence balanced against anticipatory vision there on the diagram. As I mentioned, you've got reactive, uh, proactive, and preactive, and anticipatory in this particular diagram. On the left axis, I've put uh, vision, the clarity of vision, it's either high or low. And then on the horizontal axis here, we've got uh, either the ability to execute and deliver your strategy, it's either low or high. And so uh, basically what we're doing is we're combining the concepts of flash foresight. Dr. Daniel Burris has written a couple books. He's written a lot of books. But anyways, two of his most recent books are Flash Foresight. And in Flash Foresight, Dr. Burris talks about reactive, proactive, and preactive. And then in his most recent book, he talks about the anticipatory organization and looking at the hard trends and the soft trends, as we mentioned in the beginning of this video. Over time, after Ted and I read those books, and Ted actually had met Dr. Burris along the way, I've never met Dr. Burris directly. I've been in on some of his webinars uh, and participated there. But uh, both Ted and I felt that without flow or something very similar to it, where it's this umbrella that makes or helps everything play nice together down at the uh, team and program and portfolio levels, without flow um, and having a clear, well-defined, agreed-to vision and the ability to execute and deliver your strategies, you're not going to be able to deliver an uh, anticipatory organization, let alone sustain it. So <clears throat> I wanted to share an example of flash foresight and a little bit of anticipatory vision. Out of my own experience, when uh, back in 2004, Nokia already had one of these. Now, it wasn't an Apple like this, but they had a touch screen with glass that looked almost exactly like this. It was just smaller, and it was production ready, ready to go to production. And the executives at Nokia said, no, nope, too risky. We're not going to do that. And so the project was shot down. And so I joined Nokia in 2005. And of course, that's one of the tribal stories that you hear about. And, uh, and then in 2006, I worked for Nokia Siemens Networks when they were doing the fusion. And I was leading the program that was in charge of choosing various platforms, either from Siemens or Nokia, that would be used. And there'll be other stories that I can share about that particular portion of work where uh, it just highlighted the difference between uh, how German companies thought and how Finnish companies thought. But anyways, back to the story. Uh, in 2007, I was asked by the CEO of Frugo to come and help Frugo because 
they had half of the team was or half of the yeah half of all the teams were agile and the other half were traditional and they were at war there was there was just no fixing this and so uh the ceo of frugo asked me to come on over and the board members at uh nokia they i guess they knew who i who i was and they said yeah bring him over so uh, Nokia Siemens released me from that contract, and I went over to Frugo. And so uh, they were having a meeting, I don't know, along the way. And it was sometime in the end of 2006, beginning of 2007, somewhere around there when I had joined them. And the board members dragged me into a room, and it was uh, uh, Yorma Olila, uh, Risto Silasma, forgive me, I'm probably massacring their names, Marku, the marketing guy, and Rayo, the CEO of Frugo at that time. And they, they were like, uh, hey, Andrew, you're American, help us understand this, because iPhone had just come out. And I'm like, well, I'll, I'll share what I think, but, you know, it's, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. And so, as they were talking, they, they were saying, well, well what, do you, what do you project that they're, that they're going to sell? And I said, well, I said, this first version of the iPhone, I don't know, let's say it sells a million. That's my best guess. And then they'll probably do a second version, some kind of second release. And my guess is, is that with all the improvements that they make, that one will sell 10 million. And... In the third version, my guess is is that they'll probably sell a million in the first week and a hundred million that year, and and they all started laughing. They're oh Andrew, there's absolutely no way uh, that and that, that Apple's going to be able to do that. And I and I looked at them and I said, hmm, well, uh, you guys get the big bucks. Obviously, you know more than me. And Yerma pipes up. We sell 460 million handsets a year. We own Africa. We own Europe. We own Asia. We don't give a crap about what the Americans are doing. <laughs> and I looked at him. I said, well, I said, you know, obviously you have information that I don't have on which you're projecting into the future. And and they're showing me the phone, and they said, "Well, look, it doesn't even have a uh, an alarm clock." And I said, "Well, so?" And they said, "How can you sell a phone without an alarm clock?" And I said, "Well, uh, what's Apple's game? How are they going to do this? What's the, what's the strategy?" And they said, "Well, they have an app store that has almost no apps in it." I said, well, that's interesting. So I said, in our phones, we build everything in, correct? It's all built into the software. Yeah, 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 we've got everything in there. And so I said, okay, very good. So it's going to take Apple a, while, a little while to catch up with you. How are they doing that? And the guys go, well, what we heard is, is that, you know, they're going to uh, hire programmers or have programmers develop apps and then those uh, programmers can sell their apps on the store or on the app store, whatever they have, and they'll compete with each other. And so by the time you're done paying for the phone, you end up having to pay for all these other applications. And I said, hmm, that's interesting. I said, what happens when a programmer hits on the idea that they can sell their alarm clock for 99 cents and all of a sudden he sells a million apps he becomes a millionaire what happens when they have a small army of developers producing apps for the iPhone do we have an app store ready to go well, we don't need one. We have everything in the phone. I said, okay. Well, like I said earlier, you guys get the big money. You obviously know more than I know. And uh, we'll see. Time will tell. And so a couple years later, 
and I don't remember if it was the, at the second launch or third launch, but a couple of years later, I think it was at the third launch when they sold a million units in the first week, Marco sends me an email, Andrew, do you remember that picture that you drew? It was right. I said, Marco, what does it matter? <laughs> Nobody listened. And I sent that email back. Marco sends another email back. Can I send that to Yorma? I said, feel free. And so that was an example of flash foresight where just based on gut intuition and, and existing trends in the marketplace, I was able to come up with a, an extremely accurate, uh, hey, this is what is going to happen in the future. And so using soft trends, hard trends, and understanding that Nokia had become complacent, basically fat, dumb, and happy. Uh, they're selling 460 million units a year. Why should they care about, you know, the guys in Palo Alto or wherever Apple's at? And in the end, nobody talks about Nokia anymore. They're gone. Uh, they keep talking or threatening that they're going to come back with handsets. Uh, we'll see what happens. Um, I'm not, I'm not convinced of that, but they ended up getting sold off to Microsoft and, uh, and then Microsoft put the handset business in the grave. So, uh, that is an example of, uh, executives going, we're okay. It, it's sort of, they had a Kodak moment, you know, Kodak had, the uh, digital camera already developed in-house, ready to go. And they're like going, well, we can't sell this. It will destroy our film business. Doesn't matter. They went bankrupt anyways. And so in the same way, Apple, well, and I shouldn't say Apple destroyed Nokia. Nokia destroyed Nokia because they didn't have the ability to see soft trends, hard trends. I had assumptions, but somehow I was able to project those into future facts that actually happened. And so uh, when you're working with companies, it's, it's really interesting because there are so many things at play, uh, pride, ego, and all these other things that will be blockers, obstacles, and impediments for a company to be able to step into Anticipatory, anticipatory vision, let alone becoming an, an anticipatory organization. So this is one of those uh, cautionary tales. And if I had followed my own advice, I should have been buying Apple like crazy. And, you know, in retrospective, I should have just been buying, 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 buying. And I would be in a much better position than I am today. But lesson learned. In this uh, screen, before we come into the recap, I also wanted to show you that uh, down at the reactive and proactive level, we're primarily dealing with operational excellence. And you're going to see this figure eight curve later in one of the other videos. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, it basically on the left side here, it's agile coaching and innovation and uh, on the right hand side I do operational excellence but in this version I flipped it around and put operational excellence on the left and anticipatory vision on the right but basically as you're going up and down this curve this is what they're all about by the way preactive is being able to uh, see over the horizon and so if you're reactive uh, Nokia wasn't even reactive. They didn't do anything. Uh, they didn't act at all. So they were right down here in the lower left-hand corner of the box, which should have been putting up red flags everywhere. Uh, not only did they not react, they didn't proact. They had their Kodak moment where they had the phone in their hands that was the future, and they killed the project. And so that's definitely not being preactive, being able to see over the horizon. And it's definitely not anticipatory where you're taking hard trends, soft trends, future facts and going, this is what the future looks like. And so 
they ended up paying the ultimate price for their inability to act. So, uh, as a recap, we talked about anticipatory vision, about soft trends and hard trends. Remember, soft trends are assumptions. You always have these assumptions that they can change over time. And those soft trends can change. But hard trends are based on future facts. And based on Apple's performance in the PC industry and their marketing muscle, a future fact was as if that they decided to step into a parallel space like uh, phones that were fast becoming more and more like computers, they were much more well suited for the future than for Nokia. I shared you my sad example of 11000 and I wish I had taken my own advice. And then uh, a little bit about operational excellence and anticipatory vision. We're going to get into those two much more uh, in some of the videos a little bit later. Now, the application of this, taking it out of the book and using it in the real world, is your organization reactive, proactive, preactive, or anticipatory? And if so, why? Why do you choose that? And... If that's the case, do you need to start making decisions based on what you're seeing, both soft trend and hard trend wise, and what you believe future facts to be?